Good morning and welcome to uh, the latest of our government analytics web webinars here. I'm going to start with a quick apology, just I've got a sore throat. All my tests are negative, so I can't transmit anything through the, uh, uh, the computer anyway. But I may, uh, I may just lose my voice at moments, so not to worry. So for, to start, I'm going to turn things over to Greg to welcome everybody formally before we begin our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Senator. Again, um, Steve and I at Government Analytics are quite humbled by the opportunity to engage uh, uh, thought, thinker, thought thinkers or experts in this area to put a voice to some of the analytics that we've been crunching. And so to have people like uh, Janice and Peter come and join us today is really exhilarating. It's really exciting. Um, we're really, again, uh, proud to be able to put this on and, and to have you as the uh, co-chair of one of uh, uh, Canada, the Senate's most distinguished uh, committees, the Banking Committee, moderate and help us facilitate this is just really, really special. So thank you and, and thanks the participants for joining us and, uh, and good luck with today's session. Thanks very much, Greg. So uh, let's go to it. We are trying to put this in the context as we know the vaccine rollout has slowed. Uh, the costs in lives and treasures continue to mount. The latest debt and deficit figures are staggering, 382 billion and 1.2 trillion. These numbers are breathtaking. Debt is now a, a multi-generational problem and it's not the kind of fiscal anchor that any of us are looking for around our necks. The Bank of Canada just yesterday said that it is holding their rate for now, but they too are predicting negative growth for Q1. The jobless rate is high, and I think what's more troubling in all of those numbers is that those who are falling off the rolls, that number is growing significant. So uh, <clears throat> the cliche that we hear echoed now on both sides of the border is that we need to build back better. Whatever that now means, it should mean projects with high fiscal multipliers, and we'll talk about that with our participants today, our guests, real infrastructure, not more solar panel projects. Certainly, we all agree that the federal provincial split of the pandemic bill needs to change. And our panelists today bring the provincial and municipal vantage to this debate. You have their full bios on the invitation. Peter Weltman, the financial accountability officer for Ontario. He used to work for the PBO in Ottawa. But today we begin with Janice McKinnon from uh, the home province, the homeland, Saskatchewan. I've got to always say this about you, Janice. You were the first finance minister in history to balance the books at a very, very, very difficult time. And we're glad to have you with that perspective. I know you're doing uh, substantive work for the C.D. Howe Institute, the Public Policy Forum, Global Affairs Institute. Your writings have been uh, amazing. So welcome. And uh, let's begin by just taking a look at the, the recession and, and what we're now in. What is, you know, we hear all the talk of the V. It's not a V, sort of a K. It's kind of a half W. 30% um, of our debt is foreign held. What, what's your assessment at this moment, your snapshot? Yes, I would say that there has been an incredible amount of spending. Um, obviously, with the level of unemployment and the stalling of the economy, some spending was required. What stands out about Canada are two things. Uh, many of our benefits were more generous than other countries. And there's now evidence that in many cases, we overcompensated people. That is, people were better off with the government assistance after the pandemic started than they were before. So these are problems. Um, I think the other problem that you, you have is at some point, there's gonna to have to be an adjustment. You know, these numbers, you, the, the government says, well, we can continue to borrow in the short term. All, all that is, is fine. But with the level of debt and deficit, at some point, there's gonna be an adjustment. And people like me and John Manley who've gone through that in the past know that that means some very, very difficult decisions, cuts in programs, tax increases at some future point. So that's why we have to keep this in perspective. Um, in terms of where we are now, uh, we're actually having a CD House session this week, next week on whether or not stimulus is required. 
um, with the level of spending uh, the, the, and the economy projected to bounce back. I think an, a really interesting article made the point that the best form of stimulus we could have now is for Canada to get it back together in acquiring vaccines. That, that is the most important issue right now, because if you don't have the vaccine and other countries do, other countries will be opening the economy and we'll be standing there watching. And so I think that if I were in Ottawa, I'd be focusing on that question. What are you doing to get this vaccine out to the provinces? The provinces are in good shape to deliver it. It's accessing the vaccine. So I'll start there with my comments. All right. So uh, I think everybody agrees we need to get uh, we need to get the vaccine so we can start to reopen business. But the level of the damage that's already been done. What's your assessment of that? I mean, I look in small towns, Saskatchewan. I see doors that are closed. There are doors closed in major cities that will never reopen again. And as we mentioned a few moments ago, people are actually falling off the rolls. So at that point, you can't even count the numbers or assess it. What do you think, I mean, in, in terms of this recovery, are you that kind of half W person that we're gonna come back up part of the way on the last leg there? Well, I think the forecast changed, but I think what they're saying right now is it goes back to the vaccine issue. As long as we're into semi lockdowns across the country, the economy is gonna struggle. In the second quarter, it's gonna pick up. There is a massive restructuring happening with some sectors suffering badly, hospitality, some sectors, uh, technology um, doing very well. So what the, what the problem is, it's, it's a long-term problem about the level of debt and deficit right now. And I think what's worrying is that you, the messages you've heard so far from the federal government is the answer is to just do more spending. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what, what is required is spending, if it occurs, that prepares the way for the adjustment. For example, in Alberta, a massive, massive focus on reskilling people, training, helping people adjust to sectors of the economy that probably are not going to come back to the extent that they were before the uh, pandemic. Uh, do that. And if there's investments, not investments in keeping people just where they are, but investments in getting in the economy moving. And it's hard because you talked about the fiscal problem. But if you look before this all started, Canada as a place to invest had a downward trajectory. There was a decline in Canadian competitiveness and a decline in business investment in Canada. So if they want to build back better, they have to, the the governments have to figure out what to do to address the fact that even before this started, there were problems getting investment in Canada. So it needs to be active forward looking. Unfortunately, we just can't keep spending more and more and more to keep people uh, where they are right now. We have, the government has to begin to look to the future Um, And very strategically with results that will, uh, sectors that will produce results quickly, not in some long-term way. Even Canadians themselves were sending that signal, you know, seniors saying, I don't actually need this money, Uh, you know, take it and use it in some more productive way. But, But that message doesn't seem to be getting through in Ottawa. Well, I think part of the problem is there is no fiscal anchor at all right now. So it's just like if you had a, a family and they said, well, you just, you know, you can just keep borrowing money as, as you need and, and it can go on. And so you don't have to make choices, right? You don't have to say, well, we can't afford to do this, but we can't afford to do that. And it's a huge problem. And I think the example that you used is perfect. So the government decided uh, that, that seniors needed more support. Fair enough. But what seniors need more support? Well, low-income seniors. And there's a government program, a federal program, Guaranteed Income Supplement, which is for low-income seniors. So if you were really thinking, my gosh, I have to watch my pennies, you would have said, put the money into the Guaranteed Income Supplement. It'll hit, it'll go to low-income seniors. They put it into the old age security, which is all seniors. 
any, as you mentioned, even seniors are writing in and say, what are you doing? I don't need this money. But if you don't have, and there isn't in Ottawa, a fiscal anchor of some kind, then there's no parameters. You just say, well, we just add it to the bill. And just before we leave that point, that'll be a huge problem because as you mentioned, we have to borrow this money. It's not like the United States where you borrow it internally. You have to, much of this money comes internationally. With the numbers we have today, credit rating agencies are going to want to see how are we going to get out of this to get us back uh, to a better fiscal situation. And without a fiscal anchor, it's like a, a family going to the bank and saying, well, I'm going to get out of this, but I don't have any plan uh, to, to control my spending. So that is a key part of what's required going forward. Some kind of fiscal framework that says this disciplines the government, it shows the rating agencies we are going to go to a fiscal future that is not as uh, spending prone as the one we're in now. So what's your preferred, I know you've been doing a lot of writing on this, so is it a, a debt to GDP ratio? Is it a program spending ratio? How, how do you best see them, if it was a willingness, um, what would you suggest? What would you encourage? There are many, many choices. It can be debt to GDP. That's, that's, that's harder though, because that kind of led us into this problem. Because even before the recession, the government was spending a huge amount of money. And you know they said they could afford it because the economy is doing well, the economy stops. Uh, you have a problem. It can be any number of things. It can be the level of debt to cost relative to growth in the economy. There's any number of technical measures, but there has to be some there. And as I say, I don't think it's a matter of choosing this one or that one, but you have to have one and you have to have a reason why it's going to work. And it's not just for the internal audience. Increasingly, it'll be for the international uh, money lenders. Two other things, and I, that's very important. You've had to deal with them face-to-face -face and they want a serious plan. They just don't want reassurances that, uh, that you will get your house in order. I, I want to ask you about two other issues, households and businesses, according to um, the CIBC and other institutions are saying that there is about $170 billion in excess cash. In part, the things you're talking about that people have ended up with more money through this system than they had before. And that somehow there's a pent up demand and when the vaccine is delivered to all Canadians, we're all gonna go on some spending spree and, um, and bring it all back. Do you give any credence to that? Okay, so I think there's two issues there. Um, the the buildup of funds has to be balanced by the debt levels that are still significant. Um, in terms of the individuals, that will be a hard thing to assess because a lot of them are upper income individuals and they may spend, but it could be on foreign travel. The key that the government should focus on is the businesses that have piled up cash, even if you take, uh, take out the debt. And the question that the government should ask itself is this, what can we do to ensure that those businesses that are sitting on cash invest it in Canada as opposed to in some other part of the world. And if they ask themselves that question, they have to look, as I mentioned, to recent history in which they were choosing to not invest in Canada. Mm -hmm. So what can the government do in its budget to say, yeah, this, this is an attractive place to invest that money? And that's, that's the key question. If, they, if those businesses um, invest a significant amount in Canada, um, the results will be positive. But if they hold back, as they have in the past, or decide to invest elsewhere, big problems going forward. So that, as you say, was happening in advance. There was a, a capital was fleeing, certainly away from the energy sector um, in a major way. That's not going to improve with uh, President Biden's decision on Keystone. That's just another signal to the community that uh, it's not a great place to invest. Um, there is a, a belief that investment in green type projects will be attractive to foreign investors. What's your assessment there? 
Well, um, you know, the green technology is, is very appealing, but look at who you're competing with. Uh, you're competing with China. You're now going to compete with the United States as an attractive place to invest. So there are probably targeted areas in the in green technology where we can have a competitive advantage. But there is a, a cross the board idea that this is all going to be something that's going to deal with greenhouse gases, create jobs and opportunities. You have to look at the experience of a province like Ontario, who went big into green technology and did not get the jobs and uh, economic activity that they that the government thought it would get and actually ended up with higher power rates. So I think the, the, there's a lack of uh, scrutiny of green investment and a lack of realism in terms of uh, who you're competing with. You're not going to compete with the United States. You're already competing with China. Um, on Biden, I'm not sure that there isn't more opportunity for energy investment because he's going to make life more difficult for those energy companies. So if the right uh, policies are in place in Canada, some of that investment from provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan that went to the United States may come back. So, but uh, the, the, green, the green technology idea is seen as a cure-all. And it's it's clearly not that. It's got to be done very carefully and strategically and assessed in terms of what is the long game. And keep Ontario in mind. They did that. Massive investments in green technology, higher electricity rates, very limited investment. The, um, the issue of productivity is, has plagued Canada for a while. Uh, and everyone at this point is saying, please, let's create, as you say, your phrase, tr strategic infrastructure. This can't just be throwing money at interesting projects that people might want to look at, whether it's on the green front or anything else, that we actually need to build stuff and make these infrastructure projects real, because that's what's going to create jobs. Do you get a sense that there is any um, willingness to go that way? I don't, I really don't know, but you know, there's a good example. So we signed all these trade agreements um, with different parts of the world, tremendous opportunities, but what do we have the infrastructure to actually take advantage of those opportunities? So if you wanted to make an, uh, investments in infrastructure that would have long-term results, you would say uh, investment to promote trade, interprovincial trade, but access to all of those markets that are going to become more attractive it's is one thing to get you know the trade deal but if if the infrastructure isn't there and if the business community isn't oriented to it it's just uh, a paper a piece of paper it doesn't have tangible results so for example if you wanted future looking um, strategic investment in infrastructure trade infrastructure but it it doesn't it doesn't end up like that because it Usually the um, infrastructure projects have to have uh, provincial or municipal partners, and they end up being more like isolated silos of what this particular group wants, so this city wants, that province wants, as opposed to some sort of um, national strategic focus. Uh, can we just focus on the provinces now for a bit? Saskatchewan projecting a $2 billion deficit, Alberta 10 times that 20. Uh, 21 Manitoba, 2 billion. The the last time, well, there wasn't really any uh, federal provincial agreement. There was kind of a unilateral decision by Ottawa that says the deal that Stephen Harper struck, we're just going to keep that in place. But obviously, there's going to have to be uh, a fundamental change in the transfer process on health, on equalization, all of these issues. What's the key? Uh, to unlocking the, the deadlock on this? Um, well, I think, I think, first of all, getting the facts out, because the federal government will say, well, we put all of this money into provincial coffers. Most of that money is one-time money. So it, it's not dealing with the long-term problem. Um, there has been a perennial problem with Ottawa having significant tax revenue and limited uh, spending responsibilities relative to the provinces that are responsible for social programs and particularly health care. And it's going to be, without the pandemic, it would be a growing problem because of the aging population. 
And so what the federal government needs to do is not just say, well, here's one time money to do this or that. They have to increase the transfers to the provinces for health care. So they actually have the capacity to deal with the, um, the problems that, that COVID has brought, but in the long term problems with the aging population. The other issue is um, Ottawa initially put in half of the money for Medicare and therefore had, you know, some uh, legitimate reason to set standards. They put in much less than than half, very declining amount relative to the spending. And yet they assert the right to set standards and that that can't work. Uh, You can't have a government that's not responsible for delivering the service, not really paying the, 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 uh, major part of it, but setting the rules. And so hopefully we don't go back to that point. The other issue is uh, equalization and the fiscal stabilization. So you have equalization that ensures that provinces that fall below the standard come up closer to the standard and fiscal capacity to provide services. So transfer from the federal government. But there's also a program, which is like an insurance program. If a province really suffers a dramatic and unexpected decline in revenue, it's like an insurance policy. It kicks in to compensate. The problem is that the per capita uh, size of that is very small and there's a cap. So a province like Alberta that contributed billions to Confederation over the years had a dramatic decline in in oil revenue and got uh, payments that are minuscule relative to the size of the problem. So and the, the federal government has made some adjustments, but they have to deal with that. The other thing that, that you notice here is that the prime minister doesn't really sit down with the premiers um, in a concerted way or the ministers of health to deal with these problems. They have uh, conversations about immediate issues. But in the near future, that has to happen, a concerted effort to deal with the health transfer and a concerted effort to deal with the fiscal stabilization program. Just um, where I know our time is is uh, running out here. I also want to just hear from you on the, the role of, of the Bank of Canada and what some see as a very new role under the new governor that he seems to be uh, willing to embrace public policy promotion in a way that uh, earlier governors have not, uh, whether it's green projects or modern monetary theory or the, the in point of fact, they have and are buying uh, federal debt and a lot of provincial debt and everybody's being reassured that, oh, the interest rates are low, uh, but they may not always stay that way. Right. And I think it's, um, it's a very slippery road that they've embarked upon uh, because the Bank of Canada cannot continue into the future indefinitely uh, buying buying debt and kind of shielding governments from the market. They need to, to actually persuade um, you know bond raters and international investors that that the, these bonds are good bonds to buy. So they can't do that. And I, I, I agree there's a real problem when the Bank of Canada uh, actually ventures into policy development. They're kind of crossing the line into the legislative branch. And so I think you have to be very cautious there because the, the Bank of Canada has to appear, be and appear to be entirely divorced from the day-to-day issues of government policy and sitting back and ensuring that issues like interest rates are pegged properly for legitimate reasons that are transparent to the public and investors. So um, it's unusual times and they've ventured into, you know, some of these areas, but I think they need to be very cautious and be planning an exit strategy, for example, from being the main purchaser of government bonds. When government analytics ran the numbers um, and they align actually with what the the PBO, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is saying that that we're actually looking at generational debt here, that the first time 
that we're actually going to see uh, revenues exceed um, the bills could be in in 2060. I mean, we're 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 looking at two three generations of people who will be attempting to pay off this debt. Um, you had to deal with it. What's what are one or two things that must happen? Well, I, I think I think that that the horizon has to expand because the government the government is really not the finance minister particularly is not serving Canadians well when she's saying things like well we can continue to borrow because interest rates are low that's a very short term focus that's not focusing on our children or our grandchildren because interest rates are not going to be low forever it's you know years not not decades and so when those interest rates go up, all of this debt that, you know, she says it's manageable now will exact a huge toll. Um, so I think the first thing is get the horizon beyond the immediate. It's a good time to borrow because interest rates are low um, and get the discussion onto a place that Canadians are actually looking at choices. I mean, the, the, uh, it's to me unprecedented with this level of spending to have a government saying, well, we can just continue to do this. No province is saying that, by the way. No province, but the federal government message is really, I think, damaging to Canadians because they think that somehow or another the rules of the game have changed and, you know, you don't have to pay this back and you can continue on just spending. So I think the communication is is the part in the short-term horizon is the part that's most disturbing because if you start mapping it out, uh, into a longer term, and I mean not century, decade, a decade out, you'll see that there is a reckoning coming in which difficult decisions are going to have to be made. And that would temper what you want to spend as, as voters today. Well, I think that's what, what people need to see when we have seen governments like Saskatchewan or when Paul Martin went through this. I mean, it means um, education services, it means health services, it means programs for seniors. This is this is real. It's not some theoretical tax and, and government doesn't have a lot of uh, levers left to pull. I mean, you can raise the GST, you can cut programs. There's, there's not a lot of room. Yes. Yeah. And when, when it happens um, there, ironically, the sad part of this is the most vulnerable people suffer the most, right? Uh, younger people who've not established themselves in the employment world, people who live in, uh, you know, have marginal jobs. So it's, it's self-defeating because when the, the difficult decisions have to be made, those are the people more likely to be negatively affected the most. Janice McKinnon, thank you very, very much for your comments and for that perspective from the provinces about the importance now of everybody getting back to the negotiating table and and having some real discussion on how we're going to pay the bills today but going forward as well really appreciate it. senator always always a pleasure to talk to you great to talk with you wonderful so we're going to carry right Thanks. on and uh is, is that the, your plan greg do you want me to just uh keep going for sure, and and again, thank you, Janice, for your contribution. It's 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 great, and and the discussion and level of discussion is fantastic. And yes, Senator, if you could just roll right in, oh, with yeah. he's a great a great friend and colleague, and we're again mm -hmm. really honored to have, and humbled to have him with us. Great. Matt, sorry to sorry to cut in. Maybe before uh, Janice leaves, we had one question asked during her session. Um, yeah, I thought she kind of touched on it, but let's, I, I can do that if you want. Here's the question. Uh, we seem to be moving goalposts from debt to GDP ratio to interest rate expenses to defend fiscal policy. How do you view a fiscal policy characterized with moving goalposts to now, a case where we seem to have no goalposts? Janice, do you want to just, uh, if you're still there? I think she's left. Oh, okay, uh, I think she was sort of dealing with that issue in the in the broadest way, and I and I didn't want to interrupt her at that point. Let's move on to Peter Weltman. Uh, he was appointed Ontario's second financial accountability officer in 2018, uh, and before that had various jobs across the federal government, including working at uh, 
the uh, PBO. So you know where of you speak as well. And we have a finance minister. Uh, the, good timing on taking this job, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was. It's been, yeah. uh, it's been really interesting. <laughs> so let's just, uh, for the sake of contrast, I mean, when you when you look at the provinces and Janice's point that there has to be some table around which people will sit to actually talk turkey. I mean, people have to say this out loud. It's even more difficult if you look at this from the municipal sector uh, inside. Our cities don't have a lot of money. Our municipalities don't have a lot of money. And they're the one, you know, they're that's dealing with this on the ground. That's really exactly. That's where the rubber hits the road. So we did a piece on uh, the impact on municipal finances, and we found that municipalities in Ontario would be impacted by about $6.8 billion over two years. And they don't have, municipalities don't have the ability to raise that kind of, that kind of revenue. They simply don't buy law largely. They have to do things on a pay as you go basis. So whatever money they raise has to either be spent in that year, raised through property taxes, et cetera, has to be either spent in that year or has to be kind of set aside into a sinking fund of some sort <clears throat> to be used for future investments. So they are really on a cash basis, they have to always balance. They cannot run deficits. So they're, they're, they are hamstrung. And I think to some degree, the same thing applies to the provinces, not the same way, because the provinces can levy income taxes. But the provinces are, saddle isn't the right word, but I guess maybe some might, might characterize it that way with, you know, the three key government sector uh, programs that uh, Mr. Dodge alluded to in your first interview with him, which is healthcare, education, social services, et cetera, you know, justice. Um, and that is the stuff that provinces deliver. That's really the, the makes up the 80% or 85% of the job. And those have been where the impacts have been felt the greatest. And governments can't issue currency or provinces can't issue their own currency. That's exactly. So that's it. So they have a very, you know, there was a straight jacket there as well. The figures that we're looking at here, the largest uh, decline in economic output on record for the province of Ontario. Yeah. Ontario now has Ottawa's debt of just 10 months ago. Ottawa's numbers are so off in the stratosphere, but now one province has had the equivalent of, of federal debt. This yeah. is funny. Yeah, we're, we're, we sort of think that the deficit will go from 8.7 billion last year to 37.2 billion by the time this fiscal year is over at the end of March. So that's a pretty stunning change. And largely, you know, as a combination, it's a one-two punch. It's it's a big expenses in healthcare, social services, et cetera, and also a massive drop in revenues because that's what happens when you shut an economy down. Companies can't operate, they can't make money, you can't pay tax if you're not making money. So it's been a it's been a very heavy uh, hit and a very tough time to be in government. Well, and the thing about an example like healthcare and, and to Janice's point that it's been underfunded for a long time anyway uh, by, from the federal side is that the light that COVID has shone is not just on new problems, it's on existing problems. It's not like this is gonna go away once everybody has a vaccine. We've got to fix hospitals, there's gotta be prep. We have to deal with long-term care. These are costly, costly items. They are. And I think, so I'll say a couple things on that. <clears throat> Healthcare on its own, yes, that's a huge, complex issue. Um, I think, you know, to the other side of the coin, if you will, we've seen some innovation happening in the sector very quickly. The fact that a vaccine has been developed this quickly is, is phenomenal. I'll take a simpler example. <clears throat> Uh, you know, medical appointments over the internet. Uh, doctors were able to get an OHIP billing code, and that was all done in a matter of a couple of weeks. They've been discussing this on and off for 10 years. So COVID hit, all of a sudden it happens. So there are, there are you know, opportunities, I think, uh, that can arise from this, this heavy duty impact on the system. And I think it also puts a lot of pressure on people to think a little more strategically and innovatively about how we deliver these key programs 
within our means. I mean, healthcare grows at, you know, somewhere between four, eight and five, well, about four, eight to percent per year. Um, and largely because of the demographic issues, you have a lot, especially in Ontario, you have a lot of, you know, aging population and people cost the, the healthcare system the very most in the last few years of their life, especially after age 85. They also cost the system the most when they're first born for the first year, year and a half of life. So you've had a lot of immigration and some population growth in Ontario. So we've kind of got it from both sides. And so there is, there is some significant structural issues on healthcare, the same thing with education. Um, justice to a lesser degree, but now you've seen in Ontario recently uh, a move to digital justice. And I mean, I'm using that very broadly and I'm not familiar with the intimacies of the program, but that's something that I know that this government and previous governments and many folks in the business, if you will, have been shooting for for a long time, maybe shooting is not the right word, but have been, have been striving for for a long time. And it's coming to pass because of necessity. Necessity is, as I guess they say, right? The necessity is another invention. Nothing like a hanging at dawn to help focus the mind. And right. I, I think right. that's what this has done, which is, we okay, we have to move to uh, internet health, to e-health. We have to do this because there is no other option. So we do have that ability, but it hasn't been harnessed before. It's taken the crisis uh, to make us even look at this kind of thing. But what do you think, and, and this goes to all provinces, but I'll ask you to speak to the one that, uh, that you live in, is the, what do we do? How do we harness this, um, this necessity, these inventions that have come from necessity? How do we harness, make it real? How do we force the discussion on who pays? Because we're gonna have to force it. You know, that's a great question. I wish I could answer it. I'm going to do my best to stray with, stay within the uh, the bounds of my mandate, which is typically I'll look to the reports in the analysis that we've already done. So, and you know, really our job as the PBO's job is, is to sort of shed some light on these things. So, uh, you know, the fact that I can talk to you about structural growth and healthcare and why it happens, so that tees up a problem. The same, you have the same issue in education. So you have a growing population. Um, I think let's let's go back to your question though is is what do you do and I think uh, we did a piece on the provincial federal provincial response to COVID, and we found there that the federal government basically paid for ninety seven percent of the provincial response, and why is that because there is a huge a huge effort put into keeping people whole you know, as much as possible during this thing because the last thing and I had a chat with somebody in government about this and they were asking me well, what do you think is the biggest issue I said you got to make sure people can feed themselves and that they have a place to live otherwise if you have social unrest all the most wonderful policies in the world are not are going to be worthless yeah. if you've got social unrest so that's your first priority and I think uh, you know to Janice's point and others yeah maybe some people got overpaid uh, but those people would be at the bottom end of the income spectrum and Anyway, they, they, these weren't wealthy people that, that ended up making more money from a CERB program than they did in their real life. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that a bad thing, a good thing? That's for somebody else to decide. Luckily, that's not part of my mandate, and I'm thankful mm -hmm. for that. But I just want to put that out there. Um, you know, the other thing I think I'll point out, too, is there's a lot of concern about, and you touched on it with Janice, what happens down the road. Um, the difference, and I've explained this to people, too, the difference between now and maybe 50, 20 years ago was that 20 years ago, we were the only ones that were fiscal laggards, not the only ones, but we were pretty much in a class of our own. Uh, and we were competing with other countries to sell bonds. Today, most developed countries have the same issue that we do. So mm -hmm. it's a little different than it was in the uh, in the early 90s in in terms of raising, you know, raising revenue, being able to, to, to fund the deficits and the spending. But that's uh, the and, other and secondly, who we're selling the debt to and do, is that a good plan for the long term? Well, you know, it's never a good plan to live well beyond your means forever right. and ever. Absolutely. That's just, you know, it's self defeating. And I think that's pretty self evident. Uh, the question obviously is what's the long term, what's the medium term, what's the short term, and there's a lot of unknowns right now, but I think I'd like to also say that, uh, you know, we're not the only ones in this situation, right. so it's something that it, we're not going to find ourselves uh, downgraded to see, you know, like we were almost under Paul Martin's years and under Bob Ray's and, and those those years. Secondly, two interest rates are a ton lower than they were, so they don't eat up nearly as much of program spend. So in Ontario, despite the fact that our deficit is skyrocketing, our interest on debt is 
effectively the same or maybe marginally higher. So it's taking up about the same amount of total program spend around eight, nine percent as um, as it has historically. So in terms Provided of the government's ability to respond, yeah. it's not changed. Yeah. Right. So that's a positive for now. But you're right. Longer term. Hard to know, but you can't. You, obviously, you're not going to want to. Uh, take your chances, roll the dice and hope for the best, you have to start doing something in advance of all that. Your figure is quite um, interesting, stunning actually to me, 97%, was that the number you said of the Fed's proportion of the provincial bill? Would that be true across the country or is that Ontario? I, I, I don't know, we didn't look at it. We've been asked that question a few yeah. times. Um, and when I say that, that's as of the end of August. So I'm sure we're going to be updating that report in the next uh, six weeks or so. So uh, getting the data has been tough because um, this is a moving target. Everybody's moving. Yeah. Things are being announced all it the time. It does raise that whole question about the kind of the one time infusion uh, to help out this when you've got actually ongoing issues because of the lack of funding and in, in not just healthcare across the board. So that means there has to be a next step. Yes, and here we go. Um, so I have a confession to make. Apart from having a finance MBA, I also have a political science degree, and fiscal federalism was the was the talk of the day back then. And here we are again, right? So, uh, so what does it mean? How did you, how do you work together as a federation? Who can afford what? And and we've always known that the provinces, when they were created way back, you know, in, in the early 1900s when you had the, uh, or the 1867 constitution and the provinces didn't have a lot of, didn't have taxing power. They also didn't have a lot of expenditure requirements too. And really up until the sixties, there weren't any heavy duty expenditures on provinces until education, until you had the baby booms, baby boomers starting school. And there's a quote actually in a book, I think written by Steve Pakin about the Bill Davis era. And they were sitting around the table saying, this is great. We have all this money coming in for education, but thank God I'm not going to be in power 35 or 40 years from now when the healthcare bill comes due. Right. And here we are, right? Here for we your are. Pension span. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, pensions okay. are a little, yeah, pensions are a little different potentially. It's, uh, I don't want to go there because a lot of people have a lot of different opinions. I think it's been improved because a lot of the fund is now segregated and managed uh, externally. It's not as if it's, you know, CPP used to be uh, sweet deals to the provinces. That's how they used to invest the money. That's right. changed. So that's helpful. Can you imagine uh, when we're seeing what's happening in Alberta, for example, uh, the decline in, in uh, oil revenue, which was there much pre-COVID, but it's, uh, it's real and it's continuing. And we have, um, we're not sure what it means. Janice raised an interesting point that perhaps with Biden's approach to energy at home. In fact, that market will open up again. They won't be as self-sufficient as they've been. Um, but still, it's an issue, and they're in uh, experiencing huge debt issues. Can you imagine the Federation kind of returning to a point where Alberta wasn't making the kind of massive contributions that it's been making over the last 30, 40 years, uh, most specifically 20? Like, they do put a lot into the system. Oh my gosh, yeah. They put a huge amount into the system, especially relative to the population, but they're sitting on oil and oil has been a very valuable commodity for what, 40, 50 years, uh, since about what, 72-ish. Um, and yeah, and that's probably going to change. That's what it, it certainly looks like. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's, it's, it's in the same way manufacturing got hollowed out in Ontario. Ontario was the engine of the country for, for, for decades. And now it's, uh, you know, it may become that again, not necessarily because, uh, because Ontario is a powerhouse, it's because maybe the rest of the country is starting to come back down. We did a piece on this a couple of years ago showing how Ontario had gone from the economic engine of the country back to sort of middle of the road. And it wasn't because Ontario lost so much what they did is because a lot of the other provinces had caught up, especially the oil producing provinces. Uh, but that may change, right? And we may be back to, like you said, where we were, except maybe not at the nice levels where we, where we, where we are today. I, I don't know. I'm not, you know, paid to predict the future and I'm, mm. I'm not sure <laughs> I'd want to be. Uh, but it's a serious, uh, it's a serious issue. I have a little interesting anecdote. I don't mm -hmm. know if I should share it or not, but I will sure. about stabilization, equalization. When I was at PBO, I got a phone call from somebody in Alberta who was, uh, who had looked at our, uh, our fiscal uh, sustainability and prov the provinces um, report and said, Hey, you know, Quebec's doing well. And, uh, and uh, Alberta is not looking like it's in good shape long-term. Uh, you know, it's all about equalization and because Quebec gets our equalization dollars. And I said, yeah, I said, but Quebec 
has an income tax or has a sales tax and you don't. <laughs> I said yeah. equalization is about ability to tax uh, a certain fiscal capacity and Alberta at that time had it, Quebec yeah. didn't. Um, but you know, that wasn't the answer this person wanted to hear. And I, I was reminded of that a few times on the call. And I think I used that example as a bit of a nutshell as to there's a lot of work to do to to work, help people figure out how to work together to, to solve these problems. And maybe, you know, maybe a crisis like this is one way to focus minds. Uh, I'm not saying it's a great way to do it, but no. maybe it does. But how much room, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing some questions here, but how much room do the provinces really have given that the, the, the spending rigidity? I mean, there's just, there's not a lot of room to no. change plans to, I mean, you can have minimal cuts, new taxes, but you know, it's small. I'm not sure it can deal with this issue. I, I would agree. I, I mean, I can't speak for the other provinces necessarily, but to your point, even those that are in great fiscal shape or good fiscal shape like BC, you're right. The amount of leverage or the amount of room, fiscal room they have is limited. And Ontario's were, were you know, we've been stretched here for pretty much since the last recession, I would say there just hasn't been, uh, the room to uh, to comfortably readjust the economy uh, on on its own. I think you know. I remember mean, we having a chat with somebody in one of the branches of our government here, and was asking for thoughts. Uh, and I said, I think you got to work like heck with the federal government because that's where the money is, right? You don't have a lot of room here. You just that's just the nature of the of the of the government. Um, and then, of course, you get into, you know, the politics of it, which is uh, there's an accountability issue. If the federal government's going to deliver more cash to the provinces, deliver their programs, the feds are going to want some credit for that. And then and so that, that's that's been a long standing issue in Canada. And I'm sure you see that in the Senate every day. And absolutely. And, and what do you think? I mean, I and all the provinces are struggling with this. What do you think? Um, is most vulnerable. I mean, it, it's obvious kind of when cuts come, we talked about this a little bit with Janice at the end, the cuts tend to come in healthcare and services to the elderly and the needy because they're the easiest to get at, but you're hurting the people who need the support the most with that approach. Where, where else should people be looking? Well, <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, they're all good questions. And I hate saying that all the time because they are all good questions. Um, you, you know, I guess the, and it's hard because that's not my role, right? And I have to be careful to start before I start articulating policy suggestions. But what I'll do is I'll say, I'll say that, you know, when I was at PBO, when I was at Treasury Board, these were the things we looked at. And we always look at the the big programs first because in theory, that's where you think you might be able to find, uh, you know, small changes can turn into big dollars because of the volumes. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that this government is looking at, you know, things like uh, re-engineering processes and trying to make things more digital uh, and trying to, you know, how much money is there? Hard to tell. I mean, at the end of the day, you're never going to find much money out of cuts or efficiencies. Where you find the money is on either program cancellation or, pro or major program redesign. Because if you cancel a program, not only do you stop the dollars going out from that program, you also eliminate all of the back office requirements uh, the required to support that program. Or so, the spending so that results from it. That's, that's right. Or the spending that results from it. Well, exactly, exactly, yeah. right? So you have a nice clean. When companies restructure, they hive off divisions, right? Mm -hmm. They do some internal, you know, tinkering and this and that. Um, you, but I think you always have to do that as a company. You always have to be re-engineering. You always have to be trying to be more effective and more more efficient. Uh, government's not the same. It's it's you know you got different imperatives. But that's how you that's how you cut spending is you get you get out of programs. Politically very very difficult to do because you always have a constituency for the programs that you're providing. And um, then the other the only other option is is tax hikes. Well. And that's a really good one because effectively what you're doing with by borrowing money to some degree is you're deferring those tax hikes, right? So instead of taxing people today, you're going to some way or another be taxing people tomorrow to repay that debt. <clears throat> um, and that's an interest, you know, and it's funny from where I sit and I get to see all these programs and I get to listen to the rhetoric and, um, 
And there is a, has been a reluctance, you know, for people to pay for the programs that they want. And I think that's probably a human nature thing. Um, but at some point in time, and we've been, we've been tinkering away, trying to find a way to illustrate, you know, here's how much you pay in various taxes and fees. And here's what you get back from it. We're a ways away from being able to put something out like that. But I think it's important for people to understand, you know, what it is that they get uh, for the taxes they pay um, and be able to have a meaningful discussion as to how much service do you want and what are you prepared to pay for? These are very difficult discussions because you have 14 million people in Ontario and I'm sure you're going to have, you know, 20 million opinions. So it's, uh, <laughs> and as this is governing. At the beginning, we actually have now the other, you know, we have the role of the cities and the municipalities that now have to be considered yeah. uh, because we've now seen that in a very real way. You know, do we, do we need to have a conversation about Toronto becoming a city state or, um, you know, you see a very different approach in America, in the US in terms of their structures and their payment structures and it gives the cities and municipalities in, in that sense, more power to do something about their own problems. Yeah, and I think it's history because in Canada, provinces created the cities. Back then, you you know, country was rural. Cities were very new and very underpopulated relative to today. And now the, it's completely the other way around. And yet the rules really haven't changed. There have been tinkerings with it. There are many agreements now directly between Toronto and the federal government, for example. Uh, there's some with Ottawa, some with the large in Vancouver, some of the large municipalities, and you know, things like infrastructure and other you know, uh, affordable housing, social housing. There are some direct agreements that, that go bypass the province. Um, but yeah, so then of course, you know, we can sit here and talk about all these theoretical governance structures that need to be rethought. In the meantime, we have a problem on the ground right, that needs to be fixed. Um, so you have to weigh off, you know, can, can we solve both as we're going along? And we saw the premier pleading, <laughs> begging, saying, get the vaccine here, because until we get that, we can't reopen this economy. I mean, you, we can have the debate about whether lockdowns was the right approach, but nevertheless, that's what's happened. And until there's a vaccine, uh, we're just killing people left, right, and center. And I don't mean with the yeah. uh, virus, I mean, out of their businesses, their lives. Businesses, their mental health, mm -hmm. uh, their kids, their education. Absolutely. I mean, nobody's disagreeing with that, but I think too, you know, we forget that we got a vaccine on this thing in less than a year. Normally it's a four year, five year process. So we're already way ahead of the game. That doesn't maybe give us a lot of comfort, but, you know, keep it in context. Secondly, we've yeah, I mean, what, what do you, you do the best you can, right? You try, you try your very best. And uh, I don't want to get into policy prescriptions around what should work and what shouldn't work, because I don't know. Um, I'm just an observer on this thing. But I think um, is I can't really, you know, yeah, yeah, I think uh, that is the way out, you know, but then you get into a situation, I have a son in Israel right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an interesting situation where they've got the vaccination booming along. Uh, they're now back into lockdown. They're having, they have more cases. I mean, almost, they had almost 10,000 cases, I think, yesterday. Like, you know, what's going on there? So politics, I think, is a lot of it. There's a, certain communities that won't take it, certain communities that are, have a lot of influence. Yeah. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated process. Yeah, our issues too with communities that are non-compliant. A quick word before we try and wrap this up on infrastructure. <laughs> Um, yes, we've just kind of unveiled it here um, <laughs> on, on infrastructure. And I, I guess there's a, a, a large, there's a, a huge level of frustration about infrastructure. It's just the catchphrase for all this stuff. We, people needing and wanting it desperately to be real, strategic, um, actually build a highway. Um, I, I use the same reference, not another solar panel. We know how to build solar panels. What we need are transportation routes for trade internally and externally. Um, you know, there, there's real concrete things we need and infrastructure seems to be having a hard time. The dollars getting out Ottawa's door. Um, infrastructure is from an economist's point of view, 
does have significant fiscal multipliers. So that's why there's a good policy reason for talking or at least trying to do something with infrastructure. Uh, as always, the devil is in the details. I had a chance to spend a little bit of time on that file at PBO and we were doing, we're doing some really interesting work here on assessing the, uh, the climate impact on Ontario's public infrastructure. So uh, we'll see how that one turns out. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's, there are two things. There is repairing what you have or rehabilitating what you have and then thinking strategically about what you need. And uh, those are two really two different things. And the the thinking part doesn't spend a lot of money right now, <clears throat> right? And it's repairing what you have, which spends the money. And I think we saw that after the recovery from the fiscal, the, the financial crash, there was a big push on getting uh, shovel ready product or projects. Yeah. The other, the fact of the matter, though, infrastructure is always complicated. It's always, these are complicated projects. It's not like you, you know, you've, you've done them a hundred times. Uh, they always run into delays. They're always difficult to deliver. And you, you're mixing, you've got people, you've got neighborhoods, you've got communities, you've got upheaval. So you have a lot of um, friction, if you will, in delivering infrastructure projects. And I think you have to go into that with that mindset. You can't go in expecting that, boom, everything's going to be perfect. It's not. It's just, it doesn't work that way. And you have to, you know, build that into your, into your planning, into your horizon. When you sit here and we, we look at the numbers and, and we started with Janice at the deficits at 382 billion, the debt is at 1.2 trillion, we're talking about balancing the books uh, 30 years down the road, if we're lucky, if there's no other black swan crisis events here. Um, you saying, on the other hand, here we are in the middle of this crisis, and we've responded in many ways pretty well with developing a vaccine and getting it out, although there's lots of issues around that, that it's forced some changes in terms of technology and people accessing services. So. When you, when you look at all of that, like where do you come down today? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? How do you react to that? Uh, I, you know what? If you'd asked me this question five months ago, <laughs> I would have had a different answer. I was okay. not a happy person to be around five months ago or eight months ago. Um, but the fact that we got money into people's hands so they didn't have to line up and beg for food Mm -hmm. To me, that was huge, 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 huge. And then we started to see some pretty rapid changes in terms of how we adapt. So, you know, I have a bunch of friends and even, and some, and even some of our staff that have kids in school. And yeah, it's no fun. It's a little better this time around because people have had a chance to sort of adapt. And I'm not saying they want to stay like this forever, but we've adapted and we're making do. And, uh, and there are some, and I, and I think people are, are, and, you know, this is me sitting where I sit. I think people are more um, uh, receptive to thinking about doing things in a different way. We will have another black swan event. I, I, it's just a matter of when it will happen in 30 years and we could have three of them. But we have the ability to plan for this stuff and learn from what we did. We blew a lot of the learning out of, from SARS out the window uh, and we didn't, you know, put them, our money where our mouth was. We, we let a bunch of equipment go to rot and had to throw it out before the thing hit. So there's a lot of mistakes we made at the outset. <clears throat> that hopefully we won't make again. Um, so I, I think we have an opportunity to, 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 you know, to do stuff really well, um, but it won't be easy, right? It won't be easy. Thanks very much. I really appreciate that, Peter. We've had two very interesting perspectives this morning on all of this from managing provincial budgets to, to somebody trying to have some accountability through this whole uh, process on the fiscal side. Really appreciate uh, the comments a lot, uh, Peter Weltman and, and Janice McKinnon joining us. So I'll just turn things over to Greg and you can say your two thank yous to these amazing people. Exactly, and it's exactly that. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been extraordinary. I, I should tell you, I was just talking to Steve before we started and said Thursday's my favorite day of the week because I get to look out the window and see my garbage collected. So I know when <laughs> I, like that, my municipal taxes are going. But the insights you've provided are, are, are really telling, along with the, the umbrella uh, perspective and then Janice moving down into the provincial situation and then Peter, you providing us uh, a municipal uh, layer under that was really, really helpful. And uh, again, uh, uh, to both of you and uh, uh, Senator Wallen, a uh, really uh, sincere thank you uh, on behalf of Steve and, and all of us who work at Government Analytics. We do want to thank you for, for helping out. And, and again, we all very much enjoyed it. 
And there's some great material that government analytics has been uh, creating in the last little while. I mean, scouring, and I mean scouring federal documents to try and give us some insight on uh, on money spent, money uh, that needs to be spent. It's uh, and all these figures in terms of where we're headed in the future. So find that, please search that stuff out. It, it's not like it's secret. It's just that somebody has to pull it together. Oh and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I saw it. I saw the stuff that Greg and Steve. Yeah, were it, it's great. So yeah. to, to Greg and Steve, I mean, I know those are hours where you're almost blinded looking at the tiny screens and the charts, but it's uh, it's very, very helpful and very useful. We have our moments. <laughs> yeah. See, we're lucky. We have the ability to ask the government for all that stuff, and they can. Yeah. And they give us everything, which is different than PBO. PBO still can't get everything they need. Right. Uh, we can. And I always like to rub that in. And um, <clears throat> But sometimes we can't share it, right? So that's Yeah, it. for sure. No, it's, and I think the demand for that, that's kind of another interesting point of where we are. I don't think people are going to want to stay with the blinders on as, as much as we might have before. So thanks for all the work and thanks to everybody that participated. And uh, we'll wrap this up and see you again in, in due time next due month course. sounds good stay safe and stay sane especially yes <laughs> bye now okay bye-bye